Uh, my name is Sean Hagerty. I'm Academic Project Manager with the Programme on the Impacts of Future Technology, which is a programme that makes up part of the Future of Humanity Institute here in Oxford University. The Future of Humanity Institute is it's an interdisciplinary centre which aims to bring together some of the best minds from a range of disciplines, whether it be neuroscience, mathematics, philosophy, computer science, uh, economics, and bring these uh, minds together to put and um, bring careful thinking to some of the big picture questions that face humanity in the 21st century and beyond, whether that be risks from new technological development, ways of uh, living sustainably on this planet, um, or um, the benefits that um, technological innovation might bring about. I think the key difference is our um, goal of bringing this careful, uh, rational and unbiased thinking to bear on questions. Uh, too often, you know, organisations that have a very specific goal in mind can fall into groupthink or um, just subconsciously be pushing some sort of agenda. Now, I'm not saying all do, but this sometimes is the case. And by bringing together people from a wide range of backgrounds and putting them looking at questions from first principles, we hopefully avoid that and we can perhaps care more carefully weigh up the pros and cons of any particular strategy or any particular technology without having any prior vested interest. And even often with groups that are trained, for example, in the scientific method, it's still possible if you've invested a lot of time into a particular aim to fall into pushing that even if the um, situation changes and it's not necessarily as beneficial to push that as it was in the first place. So I think that's the most valuable thing we um, bring to the table, having this kind of big picture um, perspective on it that is a little bit further back than what um, groups that are aiming at a particular very specific goal um, necessarily will bring. If a lay person were to come across our website, and I would hope perhaps they would also come across our YouTube channel where we try to put up as many of our talks as possible, which I think is possibly the best place for a lay person to start simply because many of our talks are for a more either general scientific audience or general public. But if a lay person did come across this, um, I think the thing that I would be most happy if they took away is that people are thinking about these things and um, the world isn't just full of undirected enthusiastic scientific progress without thinking about whether or not the goals are worth it some people including us think it's very very important to take a step back and to say is this something we should um, move towards this one we think it is this one there's a question mark over let's hold off until we can actually figure out what the pros and cons are and this one has too many downsides um, compared to the upsides um, if and they take away that there are people thinking about this and perhaps push other people to think in these terms, I think that that's um, a very big take home. I think that we do need to be thinking very, very carefully uh, about what directions we should take, particularly given the power that um, technological developments is putting in our hands. Well, I'm in both the lucky and unlucky, I guess, depending on how you look at a position of being academic project manager here, which means that I've got my finger in all of the pies. And for me personally, this is very enjoyable because it means that I've got um, Stuart teaching me mathematics and anthropics. I've got Daniel teaching me decision theory. Um, Carl's teaching me technology economics. Uh, Anders is teaching me brain emulation and neuroscience. And if I can maintain and develop an environment for people like them and other very talented people to do their work and to do it in a uh, way where they know they've got a job for a couple of years, I'll be happy because we are working in an area which is not traditional, doesn't have a traditional kind of background to it in academics, which means we do, to a certain extent, have to fight for everything. We're breaking new ground. Um, most 
universities don't have very much in the way of, um, I guess, what you might call big picture thinking or technology um, thinking. There's very little in philosophy um, directed at, I guess, modern day developments that may change what um, it is to be human. And I think anything that I personally can do to develop this area so that this is something that people can legitimately work on, legitimately make a di big difference on without running the risk of ending up in a career dead end because there are scientists who didn't go down the traditional postdoc route or they're a philosopher who didn't study the traditional philosophical things that make you, you know, that gain you respect in the field of philosophy um, or what have you. If we can if I can do something to make it possible for more people to study these incredibly important big picture questions for humanity, then I'll have made the most of my limited abilities here. <laughs> uh, I know what you mean. I mean, I was uh, recruited a little bit for um, one or two consultancy companies when I was doing my PhD, um, because in reality, it's a lot of the same skills. You know, it's a lot of kind of organization and management and learning a lot about a particular field in a hurry and then kind of implementing general good principles and um, I could in theory be doing the same kind of thing working the same kind of slightly crazy hours but be taking home twice or three times the salary but um, in the end of the day I'd wonder what I would spend that money on because I don't really spend very much and I much prefer to come home thinking well today's you know day of work hopefully helped our so we've been talking quite a lot about um big picture issues and um ideas like the singularity and what the program and the impact of future technology does is i mean we consider some of these aspects as well but we also try to connect the dots if you will between where we are right now and where we might be 50 or 100 years in the future by looking at technology trends and trying to predict what the societal economic um, and um, technological impact of um, different technology would be when I say technological impact of technology um, that may sound ridiculous, but what I mean is that development of one technology might impact how another technology develops. For example, obviously computation has a knock-on effect on different technologies, so um, looking at issues of sequencing of technologies is certainly a very interesting one. But I think it adds a lot to our research output that we're taking kind of real-world data today and we're speaking to uh, as many of the experts in these technological fields as we can and making hard predictions that can be tested 10 years, 20 years out. So some of our most interesting research, for example, is being done by um, um, Dr. Carl Frey, who is looking at the effect that uh, automation will have on issues of employment. Uh, it's been a um, an idea for a long time that technology replaces uh, employment and this has been proven wrong so often that it's called the Luddite fallacy. What usually seems to happen is that... Sorry. Oh, it's okay. This one's still running. Okay. What usually happens is that technology, um, technology opens up other areas of employment, meaning that in a long enough time scale, people get redeployed to these new areas. Nobody is lighting the um, gas lights on the streets anymore, but people are doing work that just didn't exist 100 years ago. However, it seems like there is a limit to how much um, redeployment can occur, and there's a big question, I think, that will come over the next 10, 20, 30 years of whether or not there is a um, qualitative change occurring. Will there be enough jobs for people as um, automated means replace more and more human jobs and not only kind of low um, pay, uh, low kind of reputation jobs go, but the mid pay kind of mid societal reputation jobs as well. They say that uh, one lawyer these days using proper database search tools can do the work of 20 lawyers in the past. And um, I think that it adds a lot to our research output that we can be looking at um, 
these kind of hard technological trends and make hard testable um, predictions. The conference was a great success for us. I think for me the greatest achievement of this conference was to bring together two communities who wouldn't necessarily interact very much on a regular basis. So there was one half of the conference that focused um, very closely on uh, technical and scientific aspects of developing artificial intelligence um, dominated by computer scientists who were working on the specific techniques involved. However, the second half of the conference focused very much on um, the philosophy and ethics of developing artificial intelligence and also aspects of risk that might be associated, this kind of big picture thinking that I'm talking about. And these are two very different communities who think about these things in different ways, use a different um, language and wouldn't necessarily have that much interaction, but bringing them together, it was tremendously exciting for us to see the spread of ideas from one side to the other, each side um, sort of updating its views. And I think, um, some very lively debate and um, some very useful interactions and it's our hope that perhaps we've um, started a seed that might lead to greater interactions between these fields and a more balanced overall um, development of the field. Any powerful technology comes with some um, possible huge benefits and huge risks attached and we think that artificial intelligence might be as powerful as they come. Uh, now the type of risks are perhaps a little bit different than what you might intuitively think. So we're all raised on this um, diet of Hollywood movies where the main AI risk is represented by a clunky Terminator robot which goes about um, killing people with you know, this very narrow aim of wipe out humanity. However, this might not at all be the most likely um, way that artificial intelligence might cause us harm. Um, we know as a fact that um, humans aren't perfect. Things that humans develop aren't perfect. If you code 100 lines of code, you've probably got a mistake in there somewhere. And there are a lot of aspects of how our own minds and our own intelligence work that we don't quite understand. Now we, uh, at least a lot of experts think that we're fairly close to the brink of developing artificial intelligence, but it doesn't seem like we have a good conceptual knowledge of how that artificial intelligence would think and would operate, uh, or how to safely develop artificial intelligence with goals that might mesh well with the goals of humanity and motivations that would me mesh well with the motivations of humanity. And so I think there's less of a potential for Skynet to want to wipe out humanity for no good reason, uh, whereas there might be more of a chance of an improperly developed AI um, without sufficient bound set on it, um, utilizing all of the atoms in our part of the galaxy towards an aim that it had coded in as an ultimate goal. It's easy to find examples of how artificial intelligence probably wouldn't work. And it's conceptually easy for us to imagine an intelligence that was quite highly developed in some regards, such as C-3PO from Star Wars, or the Terminator robot and was able to fulfill certain um, goals very easily, but was very subhuman in other goals. Now, it isn't necessarily the case that that will be the case. It may be that we develop artificial intelligence that's way beyond us in some domains and far, far beneath us in other domains, but again, it comes back to this idea that the human brain is magic and we can never create something that has the magic of the human brain. And that's not definitely the case. It is not outside the realms of possibility that we develop an artificial intelligence that's able to outperform humans, both in, um, say, computational and um, mathematical um, realms, but also in um, social realms, in which case I don't think there's anything, there's not very little in the literature that correctly kind of represents this. I mean, we could be looking potentially at true super intelligence that was able to outperform humans in every relevant domain, which is Nick Bostrom's um, definition of super intelligence that he's using for his upcoming book. Uh, our director, Nick Bostrom, is currently working on a book on the concept of machine super intelligence. 
basically looking at what paths might be to the development of superintelligence, what might be um, the various scenarios that could play off. He's looking at um, various um, technological issues such as the idea of hard takeoff versus soft takeoff. In other words, could this um, technology develop at a very, very fast rate all of a sudden or would it be a more of a steady increase? Uh, how this would affect issues such as um, hardware overhang, um, whether our um, hardware, our basic technology was ahead of what our software, um, you know, the, say, intelligence we're developing was. And, for example, if there was this overhang, it might allow for a much faster expansion to make use of this hardware. And um, various other ways in which this technological development could um, pan out. He's also looking at um, some issues such as how you might... Um, develop uh, an artificial intelligence to have goals that might be um, beneficial for humanity and um, safety facets that might make it um, again beneficial um, to humanity and it's bringing a rigorous academic um, treatment to a lot of issues like this that really haven't been treated in this way before and therefore I think it could be a landmark publication when it's produced. Well, the idea of AI in a box is one that's been floating around, and it certainly seems technically feasible. I mean, you put your artificial intelligence into some sort of self-contained unit with no internet connection, and perhaps um, what they call an, an air gap in um, computer science um, to not allow any sort of interaction. You could even have it mostly on read-only material. These things are technically possible. But again, you come back to the human factor. And you even if you had humans with the best of intention, you start off and you've got a very, very powerful intelligence that's able to answer questions that no human being, even with the best human resources, can answer. And after a while, it's human nature often to get greedy and to think, well, maybe we'll allow it a little bit more. Um, you know, if we just let it have a little bit of information about the stock market, it could make us enough money to keep our institute going. There are lots and lots of different ways in which you could imagine it's sort of just trickling in the wrong direction. And I believe there have been experiments done by some people where they effectively played the role of the AI in the box. Th these are human players now and tried to trick their captors, so to speak, into letting them out and were able to do it more often than not. So I would be concerned that while this is technically possible, uh, human nature is a little too corruptible and often it's too difficult for us to properly conceptualize the risks we're taking in um, making the most of these technologies. Well, that seems like it could be a promising approach. Um, as you say, there is the issue that it's only one more step of regulation and people can still find ways around it either by design or by, um, well, not quite accident, but without that as their ultimate motive necessarily. There's also, I would say, the issue that if you're only interacting with your AGI through the narrow AI, you're a little further removed from being able to see what's going on with that AGI. I mean, how it's, if your AGI is being allowed to develop um, in any way, you can't quite see hands on what's happening with it. And it may make it ever so slightly more difficult to keep tabs on um, development, but you may want have other strategies in mind for that. The idea of AI ethics and of AI being developed to have better ethics than us is a very um, tempting idea. I mean, surely if you create an intelligence that is more intelligent across all domains than human beings, then it is uh, feasible to infer that it may have more carefully thought out and more carefully reasoned ethics and morals than human beings as well. But I think it comes with certain problems. I mean, you probably need to build in or at least kind of train some sort of ethics or morals at some stage, unless you, you know, 
I hope that it develops some out of thin air at some point down the line when damage may have already been done. And it seems like there are a lot of questions about how you would do that. We have such a poor understanding at the moment of how human morals work or how human ethics work and whether or not there is a system that works in all cases. It doesn't seem like we currently have a system that works in all cases. Otherwise, um, you know, consequentialists wouldn't argue with, well, you know, take any other groups of um, people with different ethics. There's also the question of how human ethics are evolving. If we programmed um, an AGI with, say, turn of the cent um, turn of the two millennia ago uh, ethics, say the ethics that uh, ancient Romans believed in, then we'd have all sorts of problems if that was what was still hard hardwired in today. And who says that? you know, the 20th century views on things are the correct ones, 21st century, I should say, um, or will be it in any way relevant to how people um, live a thousand years from now. Uh, I would describe the concept of singularity as a development so extreme and radical that from the side of it we're on now, it's very difficult to predict anything on the other side. And from that point of view, I think development of artificial superintelligence is a perfect example of a singularity. I don't think it's the only thing that could be deemed a singularity um, from my kind of view of this. But for example, a world um, with superintelligence would be so very different, a galaxy with superintelligence would be so very different than the one in which we live now that any predictions that you want to make now are potentially gone out the window on the other side of it. And that's how I personally describe singularity, although it seems like, as a term, it's evolving over time. A perfect example is if brain emulation becomes a reality, uh, in theory we can upload ourselves onto computers um, vastly change and develop our architectures, um, copy the greatest minds and speed them up a thousand times. You could turn you know, the smartest person currently on the planet into a million copies of that person working at a million times the rate, which even if you don't have a vastly different type of cognitive architecture could bring about changes so tremendous that um, it would certainly fit in with what I see as a singularity. I think that there isn't a fundamental difference really in what it means to be human now and what it means to be human 12,000 years ago in that it seems like a logical progression in some ways. 12,000 years ago we were, uh, my human evolutionary history isn't good enough to say where we were at there, but my understanding is that we were just starting to develop tools in which to um, augment our own bodies and interact with our environment and if you fast forward 12,000 years that's really what we're doing to a much greater extent. We're still within our physical bodies however we've developed tools upon tools upon tools to uh, increase the ways in which we can interact with our world and um, different aspects of our environment. However what I think is interesting is that perhaps we'll have to um, sort of renegotiate that with ourselves in the coming um, say centuries in that we'll still be I guess developing tools to interact with our environment but we may bring our technological development to the point where we're no longer operating from the vessel that is our flesh and blood bodies. If we develop brain emulation, we may be using our minds to interact with the environment, but with a whole different tool set, or at least um, the same tools, but in a very different way. And I guess the other thing is, that is worth thinking about is that we've had 12,000 years of being the most advanced intelligence on our planet. And it seems like there's at least, if you're bullishly optimistic about um, AI or brain emulation, there is at least the possibility that in a couple of hundred years, the human being, um, such as the one sitting at this side of the table or the one sitting at that side of the table, will not represent the um, most highly developed intelligence on Earth. It may um, represent 
something that is as much akin to the greatest intelligence on the earth as um, the I don't know field mouse or the um, wasp is um, to us at present. Uh, I believe those lines will become blurred somewhat. We already use artificial intelligence to augment what we can do uh, on a daily basis, whether it be calculators to increase our ability to calculate, um, to cars to drive faster and so on and so forth. But it's still very much, you know, human controlling the process and um, these are just tools that intrinsically use the human brain um, as their driver. Now, it surely will come to the point where more and more is happening in the way of um, brain computer interfaces and um, brain AI interfaces where we are not necessarily driving everything and making all of the choices. And um, for example, in a future where uh, we're brain emulations interacting in a much more developed way with um, narrow or more general AIs, um, those lines become awfully blurred and I think we'll have to keep quite an open mind to this kind of thing. Uh, I'm a sucker for um, the development of the scientific method, um, breaking down exactly how to think about problems, how to come up with a theory of how this works or how this aspect of the world works, and then rather than trying to find evidence to support your theory, find evidence that disproves it, and then by process elimination, figure out what's actually happening in the world around us. I think when people started thinking in that way, it was the fundamental thing that needed to happen for us to really understand how our world worked. And to me, what really makes us human is that we go out of our way to really try to understand how we operate and how the world around us operates. That's a very complicated question and it's um, the question of how do we avoid um, confirmation biases and the various biases that um, subconsciously creep in when you're um, working in science and to plug ourselves I think it's one aspect in which we provide a very useful function. Now, my personal background is um, biology and I've worked in biology labs and sometimes the, even the best um, scientific institutions can fall prey to groupthink or fall prey to the various pressures of get the next grant application, get your next postdoc and produce results. Um, publish your positive results, don't publish the results that um, don't show anything. And as a result, these kind of biases and um, not quite misinformation, but perhaps not entirely balanced information um, ends up working its way into the literature. And it's very hard, for example, now the Large Hadron Collider is um, completely safe as far as I know, but take as a hypothetical example if somebody had discovered there was a 10% chance when you turned it on the world really did end. Now this is not the case. However, if there was that 10% chance, do you think the scientists involved would have decided not to pull it? They um pull the switch. Now they probably would have, but if it was a 2% chance, would they or would they not have? If you've based your whole career around trying to do something and sunk billions of dollars into it, deciding never to pull the switch is a very difficult thing. So I think there's a lot to be said for institutes like ours and other think tanks which don't have a vested interest and are coming at it not from the field and um, not invested in the same kind of group think as the field may necessarily have and just looking at it in a completely unbiased way and weighing up the pros and cons of is this line of research a good idea or the um, theories that they're coming up with sound is any line of evidence being ignored? Um, should we really be doing this or should we not? And sometimes you need to be a little further back and a little outside to be able to um, do this kind of thinking. I, these are, um, the idea of race and religion are very complicated concepts when it comes to the 21st century globalized world. I don't condone racism of any sort. On the other hand, I do think there's a lot to be said for 
cultural values associated with a particular culture, um, art and literature and um, language that may be associated with a certain region. And I think there's a great value to trying to maintain that in this world of globalization. I would like to think that in the 21st century, with a bit of walking a tightrope, both are possible that, you know, all human beings will be on an equal pegging and we'll all be able to interact with each other to a greater extent than ever before. But at the same time, um, a lot of this art and culture that we've spent so many thousands of years developing um, will be maintained. And there's a certain there are certain types of culture that can only happen in, say, isolated populations that grew up in a certain region and that were shaped by the environmental and geographic factors, the mountains on their doorstep and the sea um, beside them. And it's definitely the case that, you know, you get a certain flavour for certain literature from other reg um, one region rather than another. And I would definitely like to think that it's possible to combine the best of both these fields. It depends uh, how long have people been moving beyond the human biological upper limit depends on how you define the human biological upper limit. Now, as a biologist, I would say that humans have been moving beyond the biological upper limit from the dawn of civilization. We put on clothes and thus we we're able to go into colder climates than we were able to do before. We developed vehicles that allowed us to um, carry things further than we were able to before. We developed tools that allowed us to interact with our environment more so than was the biological baseline for us. And this has allowed both human spread from the hottest um, Saharan deserts to the North and South Poles. And it's also allowed us to reach greater intellectual and um, technological heights than we ever would have without um, using uh, things that don't actually naturally come with uh, <laughs> come in the pack with us when we are born. One could argue that human being is in of itself a an unusually poor organism for surviving in that we're very easy to kill we um, are not very well equipped for extreme cold or extreme heat we are not perfectly adapted to any one environment and without this ability to use what's in our environment around us to our own benefit um, far beyond any other organism we wouldn't have got anywhere and if you are um, somebody who believes there's great potential in um, transhumanism and brain emulation I think this is simply a logical extension. We'll um, start relying less and less on what came with, um, you know, the ways our bodies were initially equipped and more and more on what we were able to shape for ourselves from our environment. And to me, there is no qualitative difference between the human who decides to get in a truck and drive faster than any run a human could run and the human who uh, uploads onto the computer and um, is able to interact with the world in a much more highly developed way than a human sitting at a laptop. It's an interesting question why people are, both in this day and age and in the past, um, reluctant or resistant to the idea of progress and it's certainly not something that's um, unique to the 21st century when the steam train was introduced to Britain there were riots and people thought this was the tool of the devil and my understanding is that this has been the case all along and certainly it'll probably be the case in the future and it's very easy to have rose tinted glasses and to look back and say well everything was great back in the 1920s and why can't we go back to that world but in reality we are living in an era of economic prosperity um, beyond in the first world at least beyond anything we have in the past our ability to fight diseases is better um, the kind of life that somebody at the median wage can um, live is better than ever before and it seems 
likely that this kind of progress will continue um, given that our tools are becoming better, our ability to interact with our environment is um, getting better. The question would be, there's, the, the question would be, is how we're doing at the moment good enough if there is a large risk to making further progress? Now, in a kind of a utopian future where we develop AI that is friendly to the goals of human beings and we're able to gain vastly more resources than ever before and fulfill all our dreams, well, that's great. But the alternative might be a scenario in which we are developing technology faster than we can really plan for it and before we have the uh, level of civilization and sophistication and understanding of what we're doing to um, develop it safely and if it's a question of here is the future in 100 years time there is an 80% chance that we will all individually be better off than we would be in this day and age but a 20% chance that through improper development of technology we will have accidentally wiped ourselves out or will have developed technology so powerful that somebody could purposefully wipe ourselves out there's a question about whether or not you want to take that 20 percent risk and this may be a uh, an aspect of um I guess the increasing um, technological sophistication of human beings that is unique to where we are at the moment. In that, until say the 1950s when powerful nuclear weapons um, were developed, I mean the first um, nuclear bomb was dropped in um, 1945, but when we really started talking about doomsday devices, I mean we we're talking about the 1950s, right? Now, until that stage, there was a limit to how much power you could place in the hands of human beings full stop and particularly in the hands of a small number of human beings. We're on the road to a future in which more and more power could be concentrated in the hands of a smaller and smaller number of people. And it seems like in the 18th century there was a limit to how much we could damage our planet and destroy ourselves. Whereas in the 21st or the 22nd century, the power at our disposal means that risks from either intentional or unintentional misuse of technology goes through the roof and is worth bringing careful thinking to bear on. How should we think about risks? Uh, this is a complicated question which has many facets to it. One would be to look at what is different now than what's happened before. Um, we, what are we developing now that brings something new to the table that we haven't learned to deal with in the past, that we haven't got any mechanisms um, for, and to what extent can it cause us harm? Another is to look at how are we quantifying this? I mean, do we have models for this? Do the models make sense? How much uncertainty is there? Um, how certain can we be about whether we think something's 99% safe or 95% safe? How wide are those confidence intervals? Um, another question is, how much do we trust the experts who give us this information? And um, things are getting to the stage where technology and scientific progress are so intricate that it's very difficult for any one person to be able to fully comprehend what the state of a certain field is or how confident they want to be about something being safe or not. And this is going to become more and more of a problem. It's definitely a problem that technology is now developing at a rate where um, policy for uh, say safe development or for ethical considerations cannot possibly keep up because I mean if the top scientist can't you know be completely up to date with every area of relevant science I mean what's um, chance do politicians who also have to deal with a whole lot of other issues um, what chance do they have? It's a little hard to say sitting right now whether or not um, there will be a place in the future for humans that are biologically, I guess, fairly identical to you and I, um, as well as humans who have taken the step of um, 
going through different types of augmentation. Now, if you look at traditional human culture, it's been quite difficult for more, let's say, culturally traditional societies to exist surrounded by um, a greater society. Um, when I say greater, I guess I mean larger society around them who are making full use of um, all the technological advances that are available to them. However, it still occurs. There are still isolated populations dotted around the world. Um, the of the Amish are an example of people who don't even use um, electricity and they exist and they don't even exist as some sort of you know thing for people to gawk at they exist as a functional um, society and it would be nice to think that in the future it will be possible for people to live one way or another way however it's a little hard to say um, from here on in because um, well at least in human biological history, um, more intellectually powerful uh, hominids have had a way of making the less intellectually powerful hominids go extinct, which is perhaps a worrying consideration when one thinks about this kind of area of study, which was? Uh, my uh, home discipline was biology and specifically comparative genomics. So what I um, was working on um, for my PhD was what I like to term as the nuts and bolts of evolution. We were using um, species of yeast as a model and trying to figure out how, say, 16 uh, species on different trees of a species branch developed from one species that existed 100 million years ago and what were the actual events that had to happen for a species barrier to develop for you know one species that could um, reproduce that every member um, could reproduce with each other go to two species that were incompatible to each other to you know 16 further down the line what were the changes in DNA that occurred, um, the rearrangements, the gains, the losses, what are the fundamental processes that occur in um, evolution? I think that evolution is a um, is always an ongoing process. Uh, it's in, in nature it's largely um, how would you say, accidental, driven by evolution, or by environmental factors. It certainly seems possible that um, through directed means controlling the environment to push towards a certain goal, we can change the human genome radically. And certainly we see from um, domestication and breeding of animals that we can push certain traits out a long way in one direction or another direction and I'm not sure what we would choose purposefully to do with human beings. Um, one example might be we might try to choose to um, push humans in the direction of more cognitive ability. It seems like intelligence is a fundamental factor for a lot of things that human beings do. It, I think it would take an awfully, awfully long time to um, direct a certain um, line of human beings in a direction where they were a fundamentally different species than the rest of humanity. And I think important moral and ethical considerations would come into play long before that. And that's in itself a very complicated question that we could easily fill up an interview about. Mm. Well, maybe it'll end up looking like, um, well, somebody's predictions, Nostradamus or something. They'll see a few different groups worried about things. And perhaps, I don't know if getting lucky is the term, but perhaps we will have been on point and perhaps we won't be on point and we'll be seen as crazy people who are worried about something that was never going to happen or you know, missing the big thing that actually is leading to the singularity but at least people are thinking about it, right? And sometimes people are lucky, and sometimes they come up with the right answer with the wrong way of thinking, and sometimes there's a lot to be gained from the people who worked on the wrong direction or um, made the wrong predictions, because at least it perhaps opened our mind to 
what might be the right directions mm. and God knows enough stuff happens by accident. Mm, that's true. But I think, um, I don't know if it's a brute force search trying to predict the future. I think it, it, it is making smart decisions about how to think about the future. Mm. Um, and if we look at the future through a series of filters, then mm. uh, it's better than just trying to look at it through the, the most economically f um, feasible mm. filter within the next five years, for instance, or four years or even less. And because we're not dealing with technologies and um, like uh, horizons that are only four or five years away. Yeah. And it's also worth considering that even if something has only, say, a 10% chance of coming to pass, if it has a big enough impact, then that 0.1 chance um, that it's going to um, pass means it's worth thinking about. It, you know, it doesn't invalidate doing any thinking at all, and that it's, you know, 0.9 um, probability that won't happen. Mm. That's true. However, um, I'm a, I, I personally expect there to be a non-trivial uh, percentage of chance of a singularity happening as long as there's no catastrophes. So I'm similar to Werner Vinci in saying that the most likely non-catastrophic outcome for the next, like, although I have wider confidence intervals than he does, um, is a singularity, yeah. yeah. I think the next question is mental to societal, because it seems like um, major changes in society need to happen in that we will still fundamentally, as nations or as populaces, be producing more resources per head and therefore should be richer and um, living better lives. And it's a question of how do you translate that creation of more resources into more well-being for your population. And that's a very tricky question to solve.